Good morning, everyone. We are in Perak Zion of Megillat Esther. This is one of those key prakim, and, and uh, because this is where Esther confronts Haman, it's the second of her feasts that she prepares for Haman and Mordechai. And last night I sent a copy of a, of a one-sheet comparison between the two of, the, um, of these feasts. And so I'm going to pull it up online. And for those who are here, I'm, I'm passing out the sheet itself. But just, because I just want to give it a little bit of context for a moment, if you just notice. If you look, we'll see in the, first, the second column from the right, you have the, the psukim that describe the first of these feasts that had happened the day before. And in the column on the left, you have the second of the feasts. So if you notice, and I'm just going to go down by rows, obviously, because it's in Hebrew, I'm reading from right to left. The first row talks about the invitation of Haman. How was Haman brought to this feast? And so it says in the first case, Vayomer HaMelech, and it says to the king, Maharu et Haman lasot et hurry up, we're going to go to Esther. The second one is same, the same kind of thing. If you remember when Haman is preparing the gallows, and again, he was still speaking with his people. And at that, this was, remember, the people were telling him, you're never going to win. And all of a sudden, they come to bring Haman. So in both cases, there's an element of a rush that's taking place. Let's hurry. But then when the people come, if you look in the first Mishteh, we had the phrase, that the king and Haman come to the feast or that Esther had made. Interestingly, in this case, Esther is very passive in these words, Asher Asata Esther, which were made by Esther, versus which we'll see this time when it says, Vayavo HaMelech Vaman, Lishtot Im Esther HaMalka. That this time she's a full participant, and not only is she a full participant, she's a full participant with her regal title. She is HaMalka. Next. The next line down, if you look, and this is going to be the question of how the king, you know, makes his offer. That the king says, what do you want? Whatever you want, up to half of my kingdom, and I will do. This time around, the left-hand column, again, it's very, it's the same words, but the difference again, what do you want, Esther the queen, and I will give to you? The previous time she was unnamed. This time she is named, which is of significance. And then the last time around, we'll get into this, where she says what she wants. Esther responded after the first, in the first Mishta, my, my uh, ask and my request. And this time, Vatan Esther Hamalka. And here it's again, Vatan Esther Hamalka, she, the queen, is responding. And there's one more significant piece. You'll see at the second line, it's a little harder to see because the, the uh, letter, it's only a single letter. If you notice, she says, Vatomar imatsati chain be'enecha hamelech. All of a sudden, she makes one switch. She goes from third person, formal, to second person familiar. She goes, the previous time, if I found favor in the eyes of the king, and now she says, if I found favor in your eyes, the king. The difference between the familiar and the formal is relationship. When I speak with somebody in second person, there's a relationship, a difference of relationship, Often it's something you would talk about as a relationship of equal. To us, um, you know, in, in the United States, everything is the familiar. We don't have the formal. In fact, it sounds very strange when we switch to the formal, which, we, which sometimes in yeshivas they do, where you'll find people talking what the, I even have people doing it to me, which really I don't understand. They say, 
um, what does the rabbi want? So typically I learned from Rabbi Schwartz, Rabbi Schwartz who responds, I don't know what the rabbi wants, but I'll tell you what I want. <laughs> okay, but the reality if in Yiddish and, and obviously in German and especially in Ivrit, there is this formal language that exists. She, in this case, when she's making her request, she's going to remove the language. So we see right away, just in the big picture, and before we even get into pasuk by pasuk, there's gonna be a major shift between these two feasts that were offered, even though they're only separated by a single day. First, if you remember, she had already ever had everything prepared. Second one, she prepared for them, and we see how it works. So Haman had encountered in the previous parak his great downfall. If you remember, he went ahead and he thought that the king was going to take, you know, was going to give him the great honor. And instead of him getting the great honor, that great honor was bestowed upon Mordechai. It accomplished, by the way, one major one major um, um, piece for us in terms of the in terms of the story, where not only do we start seeing Mordechai's downfall, which his family rec rep um, recognized as soon as he came back, that once you start falling, you're going to fall the whole way. But the other piece of the puzzle is remember that the king was reminded of the story of this plot that had been against him. Now, the reason why reminding of the plot that had been against him is also significant is that Esther wasn't the, I'm sorry, Mordechai wasn't the only one who was involved in this plot. But rather, when it happens, and I'm just referring you back to Perak Bet, Okay, in Perak Bet, at the end of the Perak, starting from verse 21 from Chafalif, when we talk about the plot of Bigtan and Teresh, we say in Pasuk Chaf Bet, and it became, Mordechai became aware of this plot, and, Esther, and he told Esther about it, and Esther conveyed the message in the name of Mordechai. Now, if the king had the review of the Chronicles that Mordechai had done this amazing thing, the king probably also discovered in those Chronicles that Esther had conveyed this message as well. This can change some of that balance which Esther has been trying to change. Remember, Ham uh, Achashverosh was very suspicious of what, what was going on between Esther and Haman, the mere fact that he was invited to the first private party and then invited to the second private party. But in between those private parties, Achashverosh has one more example of where Esther is fully loyal to him and, and was somehow part of the plot to, or some of the, uh, not plot, but some of the solution to a plot the the foiling of a plot by him by having conveyed that information. Isn't that interesting that he is the king, and, and there's a decree to kill all these Jews, and he doesn't know about it. So we'll get into that today. The oh, question was, isn't it interesting that he doesn't seem to be aware of this plot to kill the Jews? Yeah. It's a famous question, by the way. Was he aware or wasn't he aware? Um, and we'll see really hinges on one word, and we'll get to that. We'll get to that today. Thank you. So, so we get right into Perak Zion, Vayavo Hamelech Vahaman. And the king and Haman come together, Lishtoti Mester Hamalka, to join in the feast with Esther. Now, here it is, Lishtoti Mester Hamalka. Remember, we had this whole question a couple of Prakim ago was Esther fasting? What day of this whole process was this? Was this following the fast during the course of the fast? This one seems very clearly, and in fact, the Al Shekh says that the first fast was still within the, the first feast was still within the days of the fast. We don't see any indication of Esther participating. This time she's a participant within this event. And we also see that this time she is identified as Hamalka. Now, why is she identified now as Malka? And without any puns intended, because Esther's star is beginning to rise. Now, the reason why I say pun, if you remember one of the explanations of the meaning of the word Esther comes from the same word we have in English, is star, that it's the same thing. So, Vaivo HaMelech V'Aman L'Shtotim Esther HaMalka says with Moshe Chalav that ultimately, why now is she Esther HaMalka? Because now she has already seen that things are happening to anticipate the, the, the total downfall of Haman. 
She's now risen up from the person who was taking that great risk the first time around, who was setting things in motion to a person who sees all of her plans are coming to fruition. She's risen up and therefore some of that fear that she had had before, which didn't get, give her the opportunity to express the regal nature of her role are now in place. And so he says to Esther, also today in the second day of the of the feast, what do you want, Esther Hamalka? Now again, he's saying Esther Hamalka is referring to as Esther Hamalka. The Malbim says, because now begins to see that his relationship with her is very significant. The Malbim even says that he adds on to the element of love that he has for her. So we know that these are, you know, this is a hyperbole. I'll give you up to half of the kingdom, and it is not hyperbole that is so foreign to historians. We see similar language in documents from that very same time. So Esther Hamalka responds, and she says, So she uses this familiar language. Uh, Rav Yoshua Bachrach points this out. Others point out the fact that she goes into second person. Give me my life. And my, my secondary request is give me my nation, my people. Because we have been sold. To be utterly destroyed. And if it was only that we would have been sold to be slaves, I would have been quiet. And we'll see what this really means. Now, what's interesting in this piece is what's the, she uses, if you notice, the word nimkarnu twice. Now, I, I guess... Um, in English, I, I guess the closest uh, uh, phrase to this would be, we've been sold out, okay? Doesn't always mean literally to sell. The first time says, um, Jonathan Grossman, the first time Nimkarnu seems to be that we've been sold to be killed. The second Nimkarnu would have been literally a sale that we had <laughs> been sold into servitude. Interestingly, what is going on here? Now, notice, by the way, she doesn't mention she's Jewish. There's nothing about the Jewish people at all. Hasn't mentioned Haman yet. She's very, very um, crafty in how she deals with this. But if you go back for a moment to Perak Gimel, to the end of, uh, to Pasuk Tet in Perak Gimel. And if you look, actually, I'm gonna go back to Chet for a minute. Chet, this is where Haman 3.8. This is where Haman begins to make his pitch to the king to get rid of the Jews. Right? <laughs> Haman tells the king there's this one nation, scattered and separate from all the other nations. They are everywhere. You can't get rid of them. And and also their laws are different than all other people. And they don't follow the king's laws, meaning that they are, in this sense, more malchut. they're people who are against the king. There's no, you know, there's no purpose in leaving him in place. And he writes, and then he says, if it is okay with the king, if it's good for the king, let us write to La'abdam, okay, to, how does Arts Girl translate La'abdam? If it's, if it's good for the king, how does he? That they be destroyed, okay? That they be destroyed, that's the classic explanation of the word La'abdam. However, and that's Rashi, remember, in the Arts Girl translation to Arts Girl's credit, they follow Rashi straight across the board. Okay, so they don't, they try to minimize the impact of translation by sticking with one commentary approach. But if you look in the Ibn Ezra 
Tanina, the second edition of the Ibn Ezra, or if you look in the Malbin, according to both of them, La'abdam does not mean to destroy. And their basis for this can go back to Sefer Dvarim, to the Tochecha, in Perek Chavchet Pasuk Samech Gimel. Because when you go back to the Tochecha, to that place, what you'll notice is that we use this very same term, La'abdam, this, this word Aleph, Bet, Dalid, and we use it with a different meaning. And so I'm just going to pull it up my, for myself uh, for just a moment. And in that pasuk, for those of you who have Tanakhim with you, I encourage you to take it. Uh, in pasuk Samech Gimel of the Tochacha, it says as follows. Okay, and, and when God rejoices with you to provide for you and to give to you what you need, and that at that time, um, so will the God now rejoice or delight just as God once had wanted to do really good things for you, after all of the terrible things you, the Jewish people, do, sas, God will also delight in causing you to destroy, it would seem to be, and to wipe you out. And how is this going to be fulfilled? It doesn't say they're going to be killed but rather the Jews are going to be exiled. In other words, when we use the word avad, aleph, bet, dalid, it's an ambiguous word. The common understanding of the word avad is to destroy. However, there is an alternative understanding of that word. And that alternative understanding can be to exile, to lose their place not to destroy them, but to lose their place. Using that idea, and then if you look in the rest of that pasuk, what goes on, he promises him all the, all the money, right? And then he goes ahead, he takes his ring off. And then only later in pasuk Yud Gimel, he sent the books in the hands of the, or the decrees probably in the hands of the messengers, El Kol to all of the countries of the king, Then he's explicit. In other words, according to the Ibn Ezra and according to the Malbim, what's happening right here is Achashverosh, in terms of the Jews, allowed himself to be blissfully ignorant. Let's take it, allowed himself. In other words, Haman comes, and Haman uses an ambiguous term. Achashverosh doesn't want to dirty himself. He is unaware, whether he's really unaware or not, but he is, allows himself to be unaware of Haman's actual plan. And so Esther, ultimately when she comes in our parak and she says, look, if he had done what you thought he was going to do, that he was going to sell us out Exile, exile us, make us into slaves, I wouldn't say a thing. But what his real plan was to kill us. So she has these two languages. We're going to be killed. You never thought about that. You didn't know about it. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. This wasn't part of your plan. You're too good of a guy. But had it just been what you would agree to, I wouldn't have said anything. Was, I'm not going against you, O king. You're a very wonderful person. You're the king. You want to sell us? Sell us. Well, Haman, said that. <laughs> Haman was the one. So she, she but right now Esther is, Esther is talking right now to the king, not to Haman. So she allows the king to remain righteous in a sense. Whether he knew it or not, most of the before she would say that he was fully in on the plan to kill the Jews. Yeah. That the word labed la really means to kill him. And he knew what Haman's plans were all along. Haman talked about another nation, right? He never said the Jews to Achashverosh. He kept it 
And, you know, Haman was very, you know, he was clever, okay? He was clever and he allowed a plausible deniability to the king. He was a very good advisor, okay? Not for us, but he was, when he started with the yeah. king, he knew how to do, deal with it. So he offered all of these possibilities to the kings. It's entirely possible, Elaine, to go back to your initial question. Did Achashverosh know that Haman planned on killing the Jews? Most of them, of course, him say he knew. But there is that possibility that actually fits pretty well into the text, because why else would Esther raise this possibility that had we been sold, I wouldn't have said anything. Whoever talked about selling the Jews? Well, if Labe doesn't really mean to destroy, then yeah, Haman had made that proposal. He says, I'm going to give you all this money. I'm going to be abed them. I'm going to get them lost, right? Money, get them lost. That sounds like a sale. Okay. And so as a result, she presents this to the king in a very, very intelligent fashion, allows him to, if he didn't know, you know, great. If he knew but didn't want to admit knowing and didn't want to take responsibility, which is why he would have feigned ignorance, great. And even if he knew it, Esther is, is not calling him out because Esther's going to let him continue with that ability to be able to say, oh, wow, I never realized this. Even if he knew it fully, this approach allows for all of those possibilities. We don't know whether he knew or not. We still, throughout this story, we are constantly saying that we don't know, the Gemara says, we don't know if he's a Melech Pikeach, a very intelligent king, or if he's a Melech Tipesh, if he's a foolish king. We have seen every important decision until now. He deferred to others. He let others sway him one way or the other. Some of them were really dumb, like, like either exiling or killing Vashti. Remember the same thing with Vashti. We didn't know what he did with her exactly. It was couched in, in terms that allowed for her just to be not coming back again. Okay, and, uh, you know, just like, you know, the gangsters would say, we'll get you some cement boots, you know, we we're, allow for some possibilities. And we say in the Pasuk, Ken atzar benezek hamelech. Now, what's the tsar? What is the tsar? So Rashi says the tsar is Haman, the tsorer. He is the one who is causing this evil. Okay, Haman, in other words, is not concerned about any kind of damage that will happen to the king by his action. If he really was concerned, if Haman was really looking out for you, king, this is Rashi's approach, they wouldn't have, he wouldn't want to kill the Jews. He'd want to sell them into servitude. Sell them into servitude. You get slaves, you get money, alamilas. You go ahead and kill them. It's not so simple. You lose that workforce and everything else around. The way Rashi says, this person is not measuring the amount of harm his actions will, will cause. The Ibn Ezra says differently, and again, this is the Ibn Ezra, and it's the second edition of the Ibn Ezra, the tsar is the tsara. As if he's saying, because this, the fact that we would be sold into slaves, that element of tsaris wouldn't even more be worth the king's time to be concerned about it. I wouldn't even raise that issue. That's the way the Ibn Ezra looks at it. So the king of Hashverosh says, and he says to Esther HaMalkam, now, right away, we have an unusual circumstance. Why does it say, Vayomer, Vayomer? Normally, if it says, and Hamelech HaChashverosh said, you'd expect him to say something. Vayomer Lester Hamalka, we see, Mihu Zeveizahu. But what's the first Vayomer there for? So the Ibn Ezra takes it again, and he says, it's almost like he's so angry, it's like he's stuttering. He starts, he stops, he just, his anger gets the best of him for that moment. And even the way he's going ahead and he's going to be talking. According to Rashi, Rashi first notes a medrash, but Rashi also talks about it, that there are two things he's going to respond to. He's going to say, okay, and Ezehu, 
So there's two things he's responding to. The Ralbag actually says, Vayomer, Vayomer, he's turning to two pe- groups of people. See, we imagine that this feast is taking place with three people in the room. There's Haman, there's Esther, and there's Achashverosh. But the reality is at the end of the parak, we're going to see Harvona is there. Now, what really happens, and you can imagine, you know, these pictures you see, whether you see them pictures of, of royal feasts even nowadays, there are servants, there are butlers, there's everyone else standing all around there. They're quiet. According to the Ralbag and afterwards the Malbim, what happens is Vayomer HaMelech Achashverosh, Achashverosh engages those who are there the servants and the, and the officers who are there in attendance, Vayomer Lester Malkam, and he then directly addresses Esther. So he's engaging two parties of people. Who is this person? Who would dare to, whose heart was filled to do such, who would dare to do such a thing? Vatomer Esther, and Esther responds, Ish tsar v'oyev. So she says an ish tsar v'oyev. And if you look at the whole phrase, haman hara hazeh. Vayomer ish tsar oyev haman hara hazeh. These are very short words. They're, it's a staccato kind of response that Esther is having back to the king. It's an emphasis that's happening by, by saying it in this fashion. Boom, 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 boom. It's like she's shooting once, once, one word after the next very quickly for, for effect purposes. That's what uh, Jonathan Grossman no, notices in it. Ish Tsar, the Malbim explains. Okay, this is a person who causes evil to others, or Yev, and this is a person who wants evil to occur. This is a person who's actively doing something bad, and, and his nature is to do bad. That's the Tsar Voyev, Haman Hara'ahazeb. This evil Haman. Haman Niv'at. And Haman Niv'at is taken aback in this case. Haman goes ahead. He doesn't have any, he's, he's in shock by this response. But it's not just Haman Niv'at, Milifne Hamelech Vahamalka. He's Niv'at before the king and the queen. Now, what does it mean before the king and the queen? So the Malbim says that in essence, Haman, when he has an accusation brought against him, there are two options. There are two options. If there are two people in the room, there are two things you can do. You can address person one, you can address person two. But the way Esther built this all up, he has no choice. If he went ahead and he now turns to the king and asks the king, wait, I got to explain this to you. The king is only going to get angrier at him because it's a black and white kind of case. This is he's going against him. Goes to Esther, only going to get angry at him. So it's both cases. He he has no place to turn. He can't turn to the king. He can't turn to the queen. Okay, so the king gets up now. He is infuriated. It says from Moshe Chalav that actually this Mishteh Hayayin helped a little bit, give him a little bit of drinking, you know, and, it, and it, it, it's able to, uh, to accentuate the emotion. He was angrier than he had been before, and he went ahead and he got up and uh, he, he, he goes out, El Ginat Habitan, goes out to the gardens. Now, in the excavations that I've shared with you maps in the past, in the excavations, we have ideas of where these gardens are. It's interesting, by the way, just as a side note, there is a, um, the gardens in Persia were gardens that typically had these massive fruit trees that were aligned in perfect rows. It was just, and there were irrigation systems. We have archeological evidence, not at the, um, the palace in Susa, but at a different palace we have, uh, from a, the same time, uh, archaeological excavations would show us actually the irrigation channels that were done to water everything within the gardens. From the way in ga- those gardens in Persian uh, actually gave us the word in Hebrew of pardes. A pardes is actually a Persian loan word into Hebrew. It wasn't originally a Hebrew word, and it's the way the Persians described these kinds of, of gardens that they had. The king leaves the room to the garden. 
בגינת הביתן. והמן עמד לבקש את נפשו מאסתר המלכה. Now Haman stands up. Now it's interesting the word he's standing up. Now, obviously it's just describing his physical motion at the moment, but we see he's in the midst of a great downfall. To try to stand up, this is his last appeal. To ask for his life, because he sees that at this moment, the uh, evil has, has come a In other words, he knows this is the end. That the king, where Moshe Chalava says that he sees already that the king has already made a decision. The evil is, is, is done. It's, it's decided it's going to happen. Okay. And as a result, he sees he doesn't have a choice. He goes, he appeals to Esther. The king comes back, and when the king comes back, he comes back, and he comes from his spatzir in, in the garden. And Haman is falling on the bed where Esther is on. Now, remember, it's not that she's in bed. Okay, but the way they would eat, just like we learned, same kind of thing we learned on Pesach time. They were they had these beautiful couches and they would eat on couches. They weren't sitting around a table in feasts in these times, and also we see it into Mishnaic times as well. Everybody, this was Greek and Roman and Persian as well. Everybody had their little their little table. They were a little bit nicer than a TV tray, and definitely the food was better. But they they each have their couch that they're lying down on when they're eating. So Haman is falling. Now, notice it's using the word falling, not nafal nofel. We're watching the downfall of Haman. He's falling at this point, that when he, why he is falling, according to the Ibn Ezra, he's falling at this point because he's begging. And he's begging from her, Rahmanus. Now, with the king out of the room, he thinks he has a chance to get Rahmanus, says the Ibn Ezra, because women have greater Rahmanus than men. Maybe he can convince her somehow. But when the king comes in, he sees this falling, and he says, oh, Do you also want to conquer my wife and my own house? Now, what's conquer my own wife? Well, we all know, Rashi takes the classic, do you want to go ahead and assault? Do you want to, not even assault, do you want to rape my wife? Are, is that what you're, what you're trying to do? You're trying to take everything away from me? You're trying to overturn my, my monarchy? You're the ultimate rebel? You're jumping on her bed with her? I'm just out of the room for a minute. Says the Malbim, no, Lichbosh, that when he came in, he sees that Haman is a physical threat to Esther. Do you want to kill my wife? Is that what you're trying to do right now? But what's fascinating is that this word, nofel, remember, when we ended the last parak, when we talked about it, when he told, okay, when he told his wife and the people what was going to happen, they told him back in Perak Vav, Pasuk Yud Gimu, okay, Im Mizera Yudim Mordechai Asher HaChilota Limpo Lefanav, if Mordechai is from the Jewish people were who you have started to fall from, because of lo tuchalo, you're never going to succeed. Kinafol tipol lefanav, you're going to fall. Here is his fall. The downfall. The word nafal is a critical word within the sefer, and we see it both applying to um, what is happening here, and also if you remember that what happened was going back. Um, if you, if you look back, in fact, back to Paragimel, when we're talking about in Pasuk Vav, uh, when we start talking, I'm sorry, Pasuk Zayin, okay, but when we talk about even the lottery that gave the holiday the name Purim, it was, the, the day was going to be in Nisan, when the Jews would be destroyed, I mean, sorry, when he first did the, um, when he did the lottery was in Nisan, he peeled poor, poor, and it goes back and forth. He peel. He went ahead and he cast lots, or we said he threw die, threw a dice. He peel is also the word nafal. Where his plans came around with the word nafal, he was told that he's going to fall with, with before uh, Mordechai. Here he goes ahead 
and he is falling. Okay, this is all watching this guy falling down completely. And when the king accuses him, when these words come out of the king's mouth, then what, you want to go ahead and you want to conquer my queen? The face of Haman, Chafu. Now, Chafu, if you remember, we have Chafu Rosh we've had before, that the way Mordechai was walking and when he was mourning the, the fate of the Jewish people, he covered his head. Okay, you would wear a veil, you would wear some kind of hood. Haman Chafu, again, how does Art Scroll translate it? They covered. Good. So what happens here is an interesting piece. B'nai Haman Chafu, there was a Persian custom. Now, first let's do the historical, and then we're going to do Chazal on this. The historical piece was that before a person was taken out to be killed, they would cover his face. If you think about it, and you know, you, we, we know it even in relatively modern American history, when someone was lynched, they would put a bag over his head to cover over his head. A person who was sentenced to death had their face covered. And that's where the modern scholars suggest what this chafu is. Rashi actually says they were covered with bushan chliman, or his face basically showed the shame and, and the, what had happened to him. But the Ibn Ezra says there's a different, he says there was a Persian custom. The Persian custom was when the king was upset with somebody, nowadays, I don't even want to see you anymore, right? What they did is they covered over the person's face. Mm -hmm. If the person was in the presence of the king and the king was upset, they would cover. But we see from within the context that all of these explanations can work. Vayomer Charvona. And so now comes Charvona. Before Charvona comes, let me just point out one thing. If you, if you notice this feast and the way this parak, and obviously it's a very short parak, it's 10 psukim. It's 10 sentences, which is not much. But when you look at what happens here, the amount of action that takes place. Okay, and I'll just give you a quick list of it. Uh, Esther says, Ish tsar voyev, Haman nivat, Hamelech kam, Haman amad, Hamelech shav, Haman nofel, Hamelech agam lichbosh, Haman bne, Haman chafu. Uh, okay, all this tremendous amount of back and forth and action that's taking place here. The idea is that when <coughs> this was written, it's trying to show how quick things happen. When we talk about the downfall of Haman, the downfall of Haman, again, this is all within a few days, this whole thing occurs, but that ultimate downfall, there's not a lot of thought. This happens one, two, three. Very quickly, this, this amount, the amount of verbs that are associated and this back and forth action, you know, in other places, what happens is that you go ahead and you start looking, you know, and, and you, have long, you have long soliloquies. You know, the soliloquy, maybe two or three sentences long here, boom, 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 back and forth within the course of these temps of Kim, tremendous amount happens. Now comes Charvona. Charvona goes ahead. He was one of the people who's normally there in front of the king. Now, Charvona had also been there as the one who had been asked to bring Vashti. Way back when he had been sent to bring Vashti. It's interesting. The amount of, of responsibility, you know, it's not the Charvona is Forrest Gump, but Charvona is this person who's given this tremendous responsibility, was sent to get Vashti, he reports back on Vashti's answer. Based on Charvona's reporting, the downfall of Vashti occurred. Now comes Charvona in the mix, and he's right there. And based on what he's going to say, Haman is going to be killed. Vayomer Charvona Achad Min Asari Sim Lifnei Hamelech Gam Hinei Haetz Asher Asa Haman LeMordechai Asher Diber Tov Al Hamelech. By the way, King, not only, not only is Haman plotting to kill your queen, he's also in the midst of trying to kill that person who saved your life, Mordechai. He doesn't connect. Mordechai being Yehudi, he doesn't connect Mordechai to Esther. He just says, hey, you remember the guy you just had parading through earlier today on the horse? 
Haman was going to kill him. There's the Eitz. Omed bevei taman. And by the way, king, if you want to say, well, maybe it's not really Haman's plan, it's in his backyard. <laughs> There's no way he can't deny this. Gavoa chamishim ama, it is 50 amot high, the scales. Not only can't he not only can't he deny it, he was planning a public spectacle to kill your greatest loyalist who saved your life. Two things against him. Vayomer hamelech, and so the king says, Teluhu alav, hang him on those gallows. Fascinating on one piece. Achashverosh doesn't consult with anyone. He just says, do it. We haven't seen Achashverosh acting like this throughout the entire Megillah. He's, everyone else consults and he thinks and there's long appeals. Here, he's doing it himself. Har oh, Charvona is setting him up. Yeah, Charvona does it, but it's like, boom, right away. We're going to kill him. And therefore, what did he do? They hung Mordechai on, or they hanged Mordechai on the, the very tree which had been prepared to kill Mordechai. And at that point, the king's anger was quieted. Now, all of this, okay, look at the, the speed on this. Who, first of all, who hung, who was the ones responsible? Those sorry seem, the people who were there in the room, they took care of it right away. What day was this? This was probably the 16th day of Nisan. So everything started the 13th day of Nisan. This is according to the Tosfos read. The 13th day of Nisan was when he cast lots. 14, 15, 16, this entire story of, of, of Haman is four days long, four days long. We don't know how long Haman was in power before he came up with the plan to kill the Jews, but between his plan to kill the Jews and he himself being killed, total of four days that took place, it may have been a little less. We're not really, there's, remember there was this debate on how long things took place, but four days, when you look at the whole story of the Megillah, you forget, because this does span many years, because it starts out earlier in, in Achashverosh's reign with Vashti, and things are all set in motion, and we still have another year to go, because in the next year that we have to go is how the Jews are going to be saved themselves, but this entire plan was these, these three, four days. Everything has happened, and with that, we're going to end this parak. I know it's a little bit early, but next week we'll pick up parak chet. So I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Yeah, there's a question coming. Barry's asking a question. Yeah. There's certain basic that one would have through Shabbos or does anybody write about these things? Yeah, Tosfa, there's, there's a lot of things that Tosfa addresses. The biggest question is really the question of rape. Okay, was she raped or was she a willing, willingly was, uh, was connected with the king? Um, well, but, you know, at one point, it's easy to say she was raped, like all of the young girls who were taken to the king. So we know that that changed, that she continued to, to be married to Achashverosh. We know that that's a complicated piece. Tosfot addresses that. It says there's an eight lasot Lashem. There are times where, th where extreme measures do take place. Um, Lahavdil, you know, we've had uh, Israeli spies, women spies, who the way they've gotten there, and, and there's actually, it's brought in Polskim, it's brought in Polskim that things actually come together like that, that uh, in Polskim that they, they talk about in modern times, Israeli spies, some of the same sources about, um, uh, about um, uh, Esther and Achashverosh are used to try to explain why it might be permitted for Israeli spies to sleep with the enemy and things like that. Um, but in terms of Kashrut, it's not a big issue because we, there are ways to take care of that very simply. Uh, vegan, okay, vegan, vegetarian, whatever. She had her own place. Remember, she had her own place. She had her own servants. The same kind of deal with Shabbat as well. But the biggest question was that relationship. Okay. Um, we will stop right here. They do write about Tosfut does deal with it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>